What's up dudes? So a lot of people have been asking me to give my opinion on a video from a gentleman named Derek who goes by the YouTube name More Plates More Dates, which I have to say I'm pretty jealous I didn't think of that myself. That's a great name for a fitness related channel. So before I go any further though, let me state I haven't watched much of his content and that's not out of any disrespect to him. I just don't watch that much YouTube unless it's for research, but having glanced at his content though, I can tell he does do good work and he uses research to back up a lot of his videos and it also doesn't seem like he does anything really shady like sell shitty hair loss supplements that are just soft palmetto and a multivitamin, nor does he grift people with stupid gizmos like $500 vibrating headbands which are supposed to regrow hair based based on very poorly interpreted science. I also noticed he has a very um, impressive looking physique, specifically his delts and his traps look really good, so I definitely trust his lifting advice. But anyways, the video in question people wanted me to respond to and give my own opinion on is a video he re released recently called What to Check with a Blood Test Before Taking Finasteride. So I'd like to go over some of the points he made in the video and just give my own take on them to give another perspective on this subject. So his overall point in the video is that before taking finasteride, you want to have extensive blood work done. And by extensive, I really mean extensive. He recommends a whole alphabet soup of hormones, to get tested by a very expensive blood test costing over $600. The tests he mentioned include testosterone, dehydrotestosterone, estradiol, and sex hormone binding globulin, also known as SHBG. And on top of that, he also recommends testing adrenal function and neurosteroid precursors, as well as lipid levels, thyroid function, prolactin levels, and basically the kitchen sink. He makes it out to seem like starting finasteride is the equivalent of beginning chemotherapy or starting your transgender transition to womanhood. It all seems very intimidating, as if taking finasteride wasn't already intimidating enough for some people. So, faced with this battery of tests, I wouldn't blame people for just throwing up their arms in the air and saying, screw it, I'm not going to go take finasteride, and I'm just going to go the just shave it bro route. So, it's important to remember... The main effect of finasteride on the endocrine system is pretty straightforward. It lowers serum DHT levels by about 65%, and it can raise testosterone and estradiol levels by about 15%. It's easy to lose sight of that in light of every speculative factor he brings up, as if finasteride is going to throw every single hormone in your body completely out of whack. So... Let's get to the details of the video. The first thing he does is talk about SHBG, which is one of the proteins that binds to testosterone and DHT in the blood. It turns out that only about 2% of testosterone is free in the blood and active. The rest is bound to SHBG and albumin in the blood. Theoretically, if your SHBG is low, there may be an increase in free testosterone and free DHT, though it's important to recognize that the body has the means of auto-regulating these free levels through the pituitary and hypothalamic access in the brain. Nevertheless, SHBG levels can be low and thus alter your free DHT and testosterone levels. SHBG is low, for example, in people with metabolic syndrome. Now, metabolic syndrome is diagnosed if you have three out of these five symptoms, and these would include number one, abdominal obesity, number two, high blood pressure, number three, high blood sugar, high, number four, high serum triglycerides, and number five, low HDL cholesterol, which is considered the good cholesterol for those who don't know. So if you have these symptoms of metabolic syndrome, there's a good chance you'll have low SHBG levels and should get it checked. There are also other causes of low SHBG, including type 2 diabetes, hypothyroidism, Cushing disease, which is uh, high cortisol levels, fatty liver disease, acromegaly, and he also mentions anabolic androgenic steroid use, which is another cause. So if you have any of these conditions, uh, you probably should be seeing an endocrinologist anyways, but if you don't have any of these symptoms, it's not likely that you're SHBG is going to be abnormal. So while I do appreciate his breakdown of the science here, I think he's overstating the importance of this particular test. He also states multiple times that DHT is bound to SHBG with an affinity five times greater than testosterone. While this is true and fascinating, it really means fuck all as far as to whether or not you should take finasteride. I mean, if it were five times less bound, would it make any difference? I guess the point he's trying to make is that if your SHBG is low, then it's going to affect your DHT even more than testosterone, but as we already established, your SHBG is probably not low unless you're already in poor health, and finasteride is going to markedly decrease your DHT 
DHT no matter what. So even if your SHBG is low, that seems like an even better reason to take finasteride. So I don't really see what his point is here, especially given that he emphasized it so much. So since I'm sick of talking about SHBG now, let's move on to his next point, which is testing DHT levels. Now, remember that androgenic alopecia is more related to genetic follicular sensitivity to DHT as opposed to just DHT levels. People with identical DHT levels can have full heads of hair or be completely bald based simply on their genetics. Remember, even women can get androgenic alopecia despite having naturally low DHT levels compared to men. So the absolute DHT levels, whether it's the free DHT or or the total DHT levels is really not that important. So in addition, research also shows that there is not a strong correlation between serum DHT and testosterone levels and intracellular DHT and testosterone levels. What I mean by that is that the equation isn't simply linear between intracellular and extracellular DHT levels. Don't get me wrong. If you have antrogenic alopecia, your DHT uh, should be low. Less DHT is better. But it's naive to think that measuring your DHT levels before starting finasteride is going to predict either the beneficial effect or of finasteride or the possibility of side effects from the drug. It's not that simple and we're not even sure if the side effects of finasteride are due to lower DHT in the first place because people with similar DHT levels on finasteride can either get side effects or not get side effects. So simply put, predictors of the side effects of finasteride have not been identified, at least not yet. He then goes on to talk about neurosteroids, mostly allopregnanolone and its precursors. The test he recommends only measures the precursors, which he uses as a proxy for allopregnanolone, since the lab test that he mentions can't measure it directly. Allopregnanolone has been measured in research studies in the blood and in the cerebral spinal fluid, and its levels can correlate with clinical depression. It is true that depression is a side effect of finasteride, but depression is a very complex multifactorial condition. So, for example, even someone who has completely normal neurosteroid levels can have chronic depression because of external factors, say like the death of a child. So it is, in my opinion, very naive to think that measuring some precursor hormone to allopregnanolone will predict the development of depression while on finasteride. If you already have clinical depression, you probably should see a doctor before considering finasteride, but if you don't, you should know that there is a small risk of developing depression on finasteride, and there is no blood test that is going to tell whether or not that will occur. It's not as if allopregnanolone is some end-all, be-all predictor of depression. I mean, after all, most antidepressants on the markets, like SSRIs, don't even act on allopregnanolone. They affect serotonin and dopamine levels and other factors that we don't even understand. So the mechanism is far too obscure to simplify the risk factors of depression to just one class of hormones. So... To Derek's credit, he did talk about PSA levels, which stands for prostate-specific antigen, which is used to screen for prostate cancer, and I would agree that in men over the age of 55 at least, it is probably a good idea to get PSA levels checked before starting finasteride, since finasteride can level lower uh, PSA levels and thus potentially make this less useful as a screening test. For healthy young men, though, this isn't really an issue, though, but finasteride isn't just for healthy young men, so I am glad that he brought up this point. You can easily get a PSA test from your family doctor and probably get it covered by insurance in most regions of the world. So it would be better to get this as a single test rather than combined with many other tests as the video advocates. So... Also, another thing he brought up uh, is the point that biotin supplementation is probably not going to help, and I completely agree with him there. Uh, even though low biotin levels can cause hair loss, the chances of having a biotin deficiency are pretty low, and supplementing is not going to matter unless you ha you actually do have low biotin levels, and that's not common outside of the developing world and probably won't be seen in most individuals unless they're starving or they're crash dieting or they're eating like 20 egg whites a day because of the uh, avidin uh, uh, anti nutrient and um, competing with the biotin in, in, in the gut. So moving on from that, he also brings up testing blood lipid levels, and there are plenty of reasons to have your blood level, lipid levels checked, and probably everybody should have them checked at least at some point, but it doesn't have anything to do with finasteride since finasteride doesn't have any effect on serum lipid levels. Also, this is a very common and inexpensive screening test that your family doctor can perform. Heart disease, after all, is the most common cause of mortality in the human race, so these tests are designed not to be prohibitively expensive expensive just because heart disease is so ubiquitous across the human species. Now, 
He doesn't seem to get into liver function tests unless I miss something, but if you have risk factors for liver disease, you probably should have liver function tests done before starting finasteride. And I mentioned this in an earlier video, but I'll sum up what I said in that video. That is that finasteride is metabolized hepatically in the liver. So if you have liver disease, then finasteride levels can build up in your system and theoretically can become toxic and put you at a greater risk of adverse side effects. Some common causes of liver disease include drug and alcohol use, Use, uh, history of hepatitis and gallbladder disease. So if you have had any of these uh, issues, you probably should have liver function tests done if you don't have any of, but if you don't have any of these issues, I should say, it's probably not necessary before starting finasteride. He also brings up testing estradiol levels. Now, it's known that 5A reductase inhibitors as a result of stopping the conversion of testosterone into dehydrotestosterone, DHT, uh, can raise testosterone levels, which in turn could potentially raise estradiol levels due to aromatization. This is not a big effect. It's only about 15% increase in these levels on average. It's also known that gynecomastia is a very rare side effect of finasteride. And whether or not measuring estrogen levels prior to starting finasteride is useful in predicting the occurrence of gynecomastia is something that's not even really well known. Men who already have high baseline estrogen levels will frequently exhibit symptoms such as erectile dysfunction, loss of libido, and infertility. And certainly if you have if you have any of those symptoms, uh, you would probably hesitate to use finasteride and would be probably be seeking a doctor's advice uh, to work up the cause of the high estradiol levels in your body. And if you lack these symptoms, it's probably not useful to measure your estradiol levels levels to begin with. So once again, this testing is being advanced as a means to avoid finasteride side effects, but it's lacking any evidence that the tests have any predictive value. So he then goes on to bring up things like thyroid function tests and other tests, but at this point, I'd like to try to put all this into some kind of perspective. So basically what he is advocating is broad spectrum laboratory testing via a specific company that he is linking to on his video. This company also sells testosterone replacement therapy and other hormonal supplements. So without attributing any nefarious motives, they have a vested interest in picking up endocrine abnormalities through their testing, so you will end up buying their products. And we also have to trust their laboratory to be accurate and that the range of normal values is realistic. In the video, Derek implies that it would be unusual if everything tests out normally. That is that most people tested are going to find something wrong. However, for normal people, the majority of those people should have normal test results. Otherwise, the majority of people wouldn't be normal. This is a clue to what's wrong with this, this video and this type of testing. You know. I've spoken to doctors and they tell me that when seeing patients, the last thing you want to do is go on a fishing expedition. And what that means is that when you do testing, you test specifically for what you are looking for and you don't do a whole battery of tests just to see if something unexpectedly comes back abnormally. The reason for this is that with any lab test, there is a possibility of error. Even if this possibility is low, say as low as one or 2% of tests, the more tests you do, the more a chance a test will come back abnormal due to a laboratory error. Once you find an abnormal test, you are then obligated to follow, follow up on it with more tests, and the problem just keeps magnifying over and over again the more you do it. You're going to end up down a rabbit hole. So my philosophy is, if you have symptoms or if you have medical problems, then you may need specific tests ordered by your doctor to evaluate them before starting any prescription drug, including finasteride. You know, that's why these are prescription prescription drugs and not over-the-counter drugs. But for healthy individuals, there is no reason to assume they need this comprehensive work done. It's just not worth the money, and the whole concept just makes people more fearful of asteroid to begin with. And let's face it, there's already way too much fear-mongering of this drug as it is. If you end up getting all these tests, you may end up being diagnosed with something you really don't have, or you may see some slightly off uh, horm off profile hormonal level that really is meaningless but will cause a nocebo effect so that you anticipate getting side effects to the point that you actually do get side effects with finasteride. Now remember, 
that all medical interventions have risks, and this includes getting a bunch of blood tests that you don't really need. So even though I do disagree with Derek's philosophy here, I do appreciate his deep insight into the mechanism, and I think he does mean well. And to his credit, I think maybe there are actually some people who would feel better getting this kind of comprehensive blood testing done. I just don't think it should be seen as necessary for everybody before beginning treatment. So that's just my take on it, and you can make your own decision, but I figured it was worth giving giving an alternative perspective on the subject so people can evaluate it on their own. So, uh, all right, folks, uh, I'm still playing Ghost of Tsujima, so I'll be taking a break from YouTube tonight, but I will be back with more content soon. So uh, thanks again to you guys for mentioning this video as a suggestion, and have a great day.